Revelation chapter 2, we've been going through this, the first church mentioned in Revelation chapter 2, uh, these, this letter that was written to the churches, this, the seven churches in Asia, this is a Roman province, and uh, we almost finished up, we were in verse 5, it says, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from this place unless you repent. The last time I had said, uh, one of the early church fathers, uh, you know, there's there's several early church fathers, they call them. They, they lived in the, the second, third, and fourth centuries. And they had a little insight to, of course, they were close to this time period that John wrote. And they had some insight uh, to what happened after the book of Revelation. Revelation was written, and uh, I said, Arrhenus uh, was one of the ones who had uh, we had mentioned last time as one of the early church fathers, and I think I mistakenly mentioned that he was the one that said that uh, the church at Ephesus actually took this to heart, what John had wrote, written, and they repented. Uh, ultimately, though, they fell away again, of course, and, and uh, centuries later, Turkey becomes a Muslim country, but um, it wasn't Arrhenus, it was Ignatius that had said that. And Ignatius was uh, associated with Polycarp. We discussed Polycarp last time. Remember, you had John who wrote the book of Revelation, and uh, his student was Polycarp, and Polycarp's student was Arrhenus. And so we have this succession of knowledge that was transferred you know, from one to the other. And to read some of the writings gives you some insight what was going on at this time. You notice uh, it says here they had fallen away from their first love and Jesus called them to repent and do the first works. Our works don't save us, do they? Where in the Bible do we have a good verse that tells us that we're saved by grace through faith? That's it, Ephesians 2.8. Right? That's exactly right. Uh, Sean hit the nail on the head. Ephesians 2 8 is for a great through faith you're saved, not of your works. It specifically says that, right? And so our works are evidence that we're saved, right? They're not the ones that actually saves us. Our works don't save us, but we have the works that God wants us to do whenever we have, are connected to Christ and we experience His love and uh, when we have this life changing connection and interaction with Jesus, we want to do what he's called us to do. We do it because we love him, not because it's going to gain any merit in God's sight. It's impossible for us to, by works, gain any merit in God's sight. It's just an impossible thing to do. So he says here uh, to repent, he's basically saying uh, turn away from the path you're headed down and get on the right path. You know, when you, when you look in the Bible about uh, re returning tithe, right? Malachi chapter three, you know, you start there, uh, verse eight, you know, read to verse 10. It talks about the importance of returning tithe, you know? And, and God actually said in Malachi chapter three that when you don't return tithe, it's rob, you're robbing God. Wow, that's pretty heavy. Right? I don't want to be accused of robbing God. And so here we have this situation where God doesn't need our money, right? He owns everything. Psalms 50 says he, he, he owns everything. He doesn't need our money. But what I, what I like about it, Kevin, is he's an indicator, right? Whenever we see a command from God, we need to return the tithe. We return it. We don't pay tithe because it, it never belonged to us. We return it because it belongs to God, right? Tithe means 10%. So... If, if we don't return 10%, there's, it, it's, it's because there's something wrong in our relationship with God, right? So what I love about this is returning tithe doesn't gain us any merit in God's side. But when we're not returning tithe, it tells us there's something wrong in our relationship with Jesus, right? God has set up these things because we're so easily deceived, right? Anybody in here ever been deceived? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a couple, yeah, a few of you have. I don't, maybe not Mark, but everybody else, right? <laughs> we all have, right? Well, if you're returning tithe, 
out of the works. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if you're returning tithe thinking it's gaining merit for you in God's sight, then it's a lie, right? It doesn't mean anything. It's not really an indicator. It's not an indicator. <clears throat> so whenever, but typically the, the problem is the, is the other way, right? We, we see, man, that's a lot of money, 10%. That's a lot of money, you know, and I don't know. And it really shows if you return the tithe, it shows, yes, you have the faith. Uh, yes, you're connected to Christ. It's an indicator, right? And when you're doing it because you want to obey God out of love, that's the right motive. That means you're on the right track. If you're not doing it, it's because there's something wrong in the connection with Jesus. You got to go to him, right? You know what? What really seems strange to me is, and I guess it's just a God thing, but you know, Hyatt is probably one of the largest expenditures in our family. Right, right. And it doesn't. We don't even see miss it. You know, it doesn't Amen. even seem to make a difference that you know it's not there. Amen. Matter of fact, we're we're blessed. More than the tithe. Yeah, if so it would, yeah, we returned it tenfold. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've experienced the same thing too. Returning tithe is a step of faith. You know, I remember when I first became a Christian and I saw this truth from the Bible. I need to return tithe. It's like, okay, I'm going to do it and see what happens, John. And sure enough, I mean, you're blessed well beyond what it would have been if you would have kept the tithe, right? Same. It's amazing to me. Absolutely. Are you able to handle the blessings? That's what it says in Malachi chapter 3. Thank you, Thomas. That's awesome. And these are truths that you can actually taste and see that God is good. You can taste and see that the word of God is true. And it, it's uh, that's the experience of my own life. And what I notice is if we are hesitant to obey what God has told us to do, we should go to Jesus. We should say, Obviously, I'm, I'm, I've gotten off track. Maybe, maybe I've stepped into the world too much or it's pulled my heart and affections away from you. But bring me back, Jesus, right? Don't wait to repent. Don't wait until, oh, you know, uh, when, when I clean myself up, then I'll come to Jesus. Don't wait for that. Go to Jesus as you are and tell him. You know, I, I want to repent. I choose to repent. I don't feel repentant, right? And guess what? Repentance is a gift, the Bible tells us. And he'll give us that gift. I love that. <clears throat> and here he's calling the church at Ephesus to repent. And I believe, you know, there's some of us today that have this Ephesian type of experience, right? You know, uh, maybe he's calling some of us to repent. And get back on track. In other words, get connected to Christ. That's the main thing. What's the biblical definition of eternal life? Okay, that's exactly right. It's John 17, 3. Knowing Jesus is the biblical definition of eternal life. It's right there in John 17, verse 3. And so, as we're connected to Christ, he'll give us repentance, right? He'll convict us what we need to do to turn. And... Uh, as we're connected to him, it's a wonderful way to live, right? That is the motivation. That is the motive to want to live a right life is because we're connected to the creator. I mean, his love can penetrate our, our sin-hardened hearts, right? And change us so that we want to repent. You know, I love the illustration, right? In the Bible that says, how can a leper change his spots? <laughs> Uh, how can you know how to do evil do good things, right? I can't change my heart. Guess what my heart is without Jesus, Mike? Desperately wicked. John, that's in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Desperately wicked. So what I do is I don't wait. When I read something in the Bible, I don't wait till I feel sorry. I don't wait until I, I clean myself up. I go to Jesus right then. I may not desire to let go of the sin, right? But I say to Jesus, give me the desire to let go of that sin. Give me the strength to let go of that sin, right? Because I have a fallen human nature that loves sin, and I battle with it every day. 
And only Jesus can give you the victory, right? And so when he says repent, it's another way of saying, come to me and let me change you. Let me save you. And so that's what all of us must do. And as a result, we'll do the works as, as a result of this love connection with God. And notice the bottom line is, uh, I don't like this uh, either be my best friend or I'm going to burn you forever type attitude, right? Have you, have, you know, you've been to churches like that, you know, turn or burn, right? <laughs> so I've heard about it, right? Yeah. And so we shouldn't have that type of attitude. I mean, think about this. He says there, an end result is if you don't come to Christ and get repentance from him and allow him to save you, then the ultimate uh, ultimately, what's going to happen is you're not going to be, you're not going to have eternal life. It says that the lamp is going to be taken, the lampstand is going to be uh, taken out of its place unless you repent. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? The way you the truth. Yeah. It's yeah. exactly right. The spirit of the truth. Uh, amen. And we need that in our lives, don't we? If you notice, the Bible doesn't have one saved, always saved. See that? He says, either you repent or you're going to be lost. That's what he's saying here, isn't it? There's no once saved, always saved in the Bible. Well, you can be blotted out of the book of life, which means that you can be in it and blotted out. And then that sounds like something from the book of Revelation. You know where that's from? In. You can be written in, blotted out, written in, blotted out, over and over. Well, the thing about it is, I think when you accept Christ, you're written in the book of life. Okay? When your name comes up in the judgment, Either Isaiah 44, verse 22 takes place, or Revelation chapter 3, verse 5 takes place. It's one of the two, right? Anybody want to read those verses? <laughs> we'll see what it's talking about there. I have Revelation 3, 5. Okay, what does it say? The one who conquers will be clothed uh, thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. So you could have your name blotted out of the book of life. That's what Revelation 3, 5 is saying, right? What does Isaiah 44, 22 say? I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions and like a cloud your sins. Return to me for I have been redeemed. So whenever this pre-advent judgment process is taking place in heaven and your name comes up, right? <clears throat> Maurice. Your name comes up. They open uh, the book of life because it's only people who is in the book of life whose names are going to be brought forward in the pre-advent judgment, right? People who are not in the book of life are not involved in the pre-advent judgment because the Bible says in John 3, 18, they're condemned already, okay? So your name comes up, all right? And what does it say under your name? It says, blank, blank. no, Jesus. Is. It says, he raised the dead. He healed the blind. He walked on the water. He, yeah, Christ's righteousness is put in your place, right? You're not putting any trust in any works you've done. You're putting all your trust in Christ's righteousness. When you accept Christ's righteousness by faith, faith, this is Romans chapter 3, verses 22 and 23, right? When you accept Christ's righteousness by faith, his good works are put on your account. When your name comes up in the judgment, guess what? They see Jesus' good works. And guess what? All the sins that you have all down through your life, confessed and forsaken, right? They are blotted out. Put in the depths of the sea. Matter of fact, Whenever Jesus comes back again, the second coming, he takes all the sins you've confessed and forsaken and been blotted out, and they're going to be placed in the head of the scapegoat, Satan. Maurice? So that's like in the 11, the base chapter, it only talks about all the good things that these people did. It doesn't tell about all the bad stuff. He says they were this, 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 and this. And he, God only recognizes the good stuff because by faith, I love that. Isn't that beautiful? You know, there's that. record of all kinds of other stuff that they did. When God looks at it, he only sees that good stuff. And the beautiful thing about this is God treats you <clears throat> as if you had never sinned. 
just if I never see That's exactly. Right. Yeah, there you go. I like it. And so, yes. So our life is like, don't be rats or toys. Our righteousness. But he covers us with his robe of righteousness. So it's the contrast of the two clothes. Don't be rats in his robe of righteousness. Amen. That's true. Uh, Isaiah chapter 64 is where it says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And I'm almost positive it's verse 6, but somebody may want to check me on that. Um, Isaiah 64, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. <coughs> yep, is that correct? Mine's just a polluted term. <laughs> You know, when you read through the book of Revelation, you can't help but discuss righteousness by faith. Notice in Jeremiah 33, this is what the Bible says in verse 16. It says, and this is the name by which she will be called the Lord, our righteousness. It's also found in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6. You can see it in Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 10. The Lord, our righteousness. I mean, that's the only way we can be righteous in God's sight is through Christ. There is no other way. That's why in John 14, 6, he says he's the only way to salvation, right? So repentance. You recognize you got to repent? Go to Jesus. He'll give you repentance. Don't wait until you repent and then go to Jesus. That's not how it works. You can't generate repentance yourself. You've got a, a heart you can't trust, right? This isn't the Disney Channel. What I mean is, have you noticed, yeah, how many times in Disney cartoons and films and videos it says, what does it say, Melissa? Just trust your heart. Just follow trust your heart. heart. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. How many different times does it say that? If you follow your heart, you're going to be in trouble. Just right? your feelings are always right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trust your feelings. Well, unfortunately, that's not a very good uh, message. Is it? Right, right. And so that's exactly what Satan told uh the, well, he told Eve that too, but I think he told the angels in heaven who followed him became the demons, right? That uh, results in demonic activity if you follow that type of teaching. So repentance is an important process that takes place as a result of being connected to Christ. Verse 6, for this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Okay. So we have to rely upon these early church fathers. Irenaeus is the guy we're going to again. And if you remember with Irenaeus, uh, he lived from 130 to 202. Okay, that's the time frame. So you got John wrote the book of Revelation about 95 AD. I don't know when he died, probably shortly after, who knows, 100, around 100. And uh, his student was Polycarp. Polycarp's student was Irenaeus. And Irenaeus... Uh, he makes this statement. Um, he said this Nicolaitans came from Nicholas in Acts chapter 6. So we go back to Acts chapter 6, and we see that uh, at one point in time, he was part of the church. He was one of the deacons. This is Acts chapter 6. The early church uh, was having an issue between the the Jews and the Gentiles, the, uh, we had the Hebrews, uh, I, well, I'm going to say not really Gentiles, you had the, uh, the Hebrews by the Hellenists, those are the Greeks, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution, so they had this issue going on between the Greeks and the Jews in the early church, and they had this, uh, um, decision that they would select seven men of good reputation in verse three full of the holy spirit and wisdom and uh it was their responsibility to make sure that uh things were set in order properly they were going to be put over the business of the church 
why while the uh, the disciples could share the word of God, it would free up their time to share and preach and teach the word of God to people in the early church and help people be converted. Notice verse five and the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit and Philip, uh, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Herminius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Now, so a proselyte is somebody who converted to Judaism, right? right. <clears throat> this is the only place in the New Testament the word proselyte is used like that, he, that, he's, that a proselyte is talked about like that. So given a specific name. So Nicholas was one who converted to, to Judaism, and then he converts to Christianity. At some point in time, according to the early church fathers, the tradition is that Nicholas fell away and developed this heretical teaching that's called Gnosticism, okay? And, and part of Gnosticism is this teaching of the Nicolaitans. So you have two men in the book of Acts that are associated with Gnosticism, and uh, one is Nicholas, and the other is found in Acts chapter 8. You have a guy named Simon Magus. And Magus means magician. We have this situation to where uh, in verse 9 of Acts chapter 8, there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. So you can imagine he had this big head, right? <laughs> he was very uh, into himself and being exalted and praised by others. They heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. So he is a Jew who played upon the superstitions of the heathen. That's what he did. Okay, he knew that it wasn't uh, true, but they didn't know. And he wanted to be exalted and praised and treated as someone great and special. So they listened to him. Then Philip comes along. And Philip is the one who is, uh, he's a, a traveling evangelist. He had a special way of traveling, Mark. Uh, he could be transported. You know how the Star Trek, you got the transporter? Well, it seems to me that he was actually physically transported. Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, have you ever read uh, Jack Blanco's story? Jack Blanco wrote uh, a paraphrase of the Bible clear word. called The Clear Word. And uh, he was a professor of religion at Southern Adventist University. He was actually head of the religion department at one point in time. And uh, he spent quite a bit of time translating the Bible into a paraphrase to make it easier uh, for people to understand. And so uh, that's what the clear word's about. And in his story, he tells how he basically, um, uh, when he was a young man, he, his mother's family lived in Germany. And so in the 1930s, he went to Germany, John, and, and he spent some time on the farm. Uh, like with his grandfather. Well, guess what happened? World War II broke out. Here he is, an American living on a German farm <laughs> during World War II, and uh, he was put into a concentration camp, essentially. And in this concentration camp, um, he was praying to God one day, and he found himself uh, just like what happened to Philip there. Philip was in one place, all of a sudden, he'd be in another place. This happened to Jack Blanco. He was inside the concentration camp. Then he found himself outside the concentration camp. Yeah. And ultimately, the Americans came in, and he's like, you know, I'm an American, too. Oh, yeah, sure you are. <laughs> you, know, you know, I promise I am. And he eventually convinced them and went on to get his the theology training and became a professor of theology. And so it's really a great story. I want to recommend that. There's actually a video about his life as well, if you want to watch that. Jack Blanco. Is that the name? I don't know the name of it. Jack Blanco and his story or something like that. I can't remember the name of the video, but I would, I think you could probably even watch it on YouTube. I, 
Uh, I can't remember how I watched it, but that may have been the way I did it. Uh, but here we have Philip. He comes to Samaria and he's preaching, right? This is verse 12 of Acts chapter 8. They believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Both men and women were baptized. Guess what? Simon Magus, verse 13, himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. He wanted to be able to do the miracles and signs, you see. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. And as yet, he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. You notice we have a baptism here in the name of Jesus. We have them come up on the platform. I call the eld elders up. We lay hands on and we pray for the person who received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter said to him, Your money perished with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You can see his attitude, right? You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. And he calls him to repent. Okay, well, Simon Magus, um, as you can see, even though he was he believed in Jesus and was baptized, he wasn't he wasn't fully converted, and ultimately he fell away and established Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is this idea of of, of where uh, your mind is diverted away from the teachings of Jesus onto uh, things that are made up. Uh, I could say teachings of the world, right? Uh, Gnostics, they studied angelology. They, they believe they set up this hierarchy of angels and they believe in angelology and astrology. Okay. And uh, one of the teachings that seems to be common with the Nicolaitans, which is part of Gnosticism, is they didn't believe that um, Jesus was God in the flesh. They had these different thoughts about it, you know. Well, God chose somebody who was really good and said, okay, now this is the Messiah, right? And so it's those type of things, teachings that were not in harmony with the word of God. As a matter of fact, I've got a statement from one of the early church fathers. Remember Irenaeus? Let me pull this up and listen to what he says here. This is from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. It says, one of the heretical sects that plagued the churches at Ephesus and Pergamon was the Nicolaitans, and perhaps elsewhere. Irenaeus identifies the Nicolaitans as a Gnostic sect, and this is from the writings of Irenaeus, okay? John, the disciple of the Lord, so this is John who wrote the book of Revelation, preaches this faith, the deity of Christ. See, it was about the nature of Jesus, right? And seeks by the proclamation of the gospel to remove that error, which by Serenthus, Serenthus was somebody who bought into this type of teaching, and he was from Alexandria, had been disseminating among men in a long time previously by those termed Nicolaitans, who are an offset of that knowledge, that's Gnosticism, falsely so called that he might confound them, persuade them that there is but one God who made all things by his word. So this is Irenaeus talking about uh, the Nicolaitans and how they were part of Gnosticism. And essentially what they taught was this. It doesn't matter what you do in the deeds of the body. You can still be saved. Once they don't be saved. You see this? Once they don't be saved, teaching comes from Nicolaitans. See that? Law is done away with. It doesn't matter what you do in the flesh. As long as you believe in Jesus, you're going to be saved. That's the Nicolaitan teaching. Have you ever heard that teaching in anybody, any other churches? I have. That comes from the Nicolaitans. And, and what does God say, what does Christ say about the teachings of the Nicolaitans right there in Ephesians? This idea 
that the law of God's been done away with, and it doesn't matter what you do in the flesh. If you love me, keep my commandments. He says that in John 14, 15, doesn't he? So we know it's important to keep the commandments of God. In Revelation 2, 6, what does he say about he the Nicolaitans? He hates it. He hates it, right? He hates it. He hates this idea of once saved, always saved. He hates this idea that the law is done away with. He hates this idea that it doesn't matter what you do in the flesh. You see, the Greeks taught, the Greek philosophy was, there's a spirit that lives in your flesh. The flesh is evil and the spirit is good. When you die, the spirit's released, right? So that leads into spiritualism, right? So you have two teachings that uh, come from Greek philosophy, essentially, and Gnosticism, that has crept into the church today, right? This idea of once saved, always saved, uh, the law's done away with, it doesn't matter what you do in the flesh, as long as you believe in Jesus, you're okay. See, Simon Magnus believed in Jesus. So Satan is saved. He believes in Jesus. That's exactly right. Uh, Nicholas believed in Jesus. So yet they both were part of this heretical teaching called Gnosticism that was taking people away from Christ, you see. So let's go. Where's where that found at? Where do the demons believe in tremble? Did you say James chapter 2? <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So would you believe that? Find that. It may be around verse 19, but I, I'm not I'm not, not be right on track there. So what, what is it, James chapter 2? Did you find it, Thomas? James chapter 2, verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Yeah. It's not that they don't acknowledge. It's not that they don't believe it's true. Right? It's that they don't have a connection to Christ. You see, there are two components to faith. Believe and trust. Oh, they believe. They just don't trust. <clears throat> the devil has built or deceived them into not trusting Christ. Whenever you hear some of these teachings, you have a tendency not to trust God. Think about it. Either I'm going to accept Christ as the Lord and Savior, he's going to bring me forever. <clears throat> Does that build trust? No. It builds distrust, doesn't it? And a rebel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, that very concept has is responsible for I don't know how many different professed atheists down there. Right? The strictest of parents produce the most rebellious children. The strictest of parents who do it out of another motivation besides love. Yeah. Right? Right? You know, sometimes it's okay to be strict if it's based on love. In other words, I don't want my child playing in the street when they're five years old. Right? Okay? You want to play in the street? No, oh, okay, go ahead, play in the street. You know, yeah. no, I'm going to be strict, right? I'm going to, but I'm doing it out of love, and so I think there is this idea. It's okay, uh, and and you can you can explain it to them, right? See what happens when you see that dog that was hit by the car. That could be you, right? Well, you break discipline, right? Out of fear. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to be that. Countries, or even uh, right. So this idea of fear, fear is a big motivator, isn't it? It is. It's a powerful motivator for that instant. Somebody holds a gun to my head, he can get me to do stuff, right? But it's not because I love them. Not because I'm devoted to them. Not because I'm loyal, right? Because I'm afraid. And what does First John four eighteen say? If any of you are serving God or trying to keep his commandments out of fear, it's a false religion. Okay? It means nothing. John, 1 John 4, 18, what's it say there? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Matter of fact, it uses the word torment. That punishment is torment. And so, if you're following God out of fear, then you're following out of the wrong motivation. So fear's got a couple of different meanings in the Bible. It can mean, I'm afraid you're going to hurt me, fear, or it can mean, uh, I'm in awe of who you are, right? 
the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's that's a different kind of fear. Sometimes the English language doesn't really differentiate, and we have to find out what, what it means by that. Let, let's let me go, Maurice. I just I've heard people say, "Oh, the you know, we don't, the law is done away with. It's all about relationship with God." But then when you ask them, "Oh, what's the first four? Well, it has to do with your relationship with God, and the last six is your relationship with God. Oops, they're all about relationship. That's right. <laughs> Or a circular reasoning. That's exactly right. And we're, we're gonna we're gonna jump back into that uh, about the law. Notice um, this idea of fear can be defined the two different ways. I'm afraid you're gonna hurt me, or I'm in awe of you. Okay. Respect. It's respect. Notice how it's defined in Psalms 89 verse 7. How Hebrew poetry is a little bit different than the way we look at poetry, right? Uh, we want, we like to rhyme things. You know, roses are red, violets are blue. Uh, you like me and I like you, right? So <laughs> we, we like it to rhyme, but Hebrew poetry is a little different. And here we have this in Psalms. They make a statement about God. Then they make another statement uh, about God that's the same idea, right? In different words. So notice this. Notice what it says in Psalm 89, verse 7. So, so, greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about to die. So notice, we're, we're, we're supposed to hold him in reverence, right? See how fear there means reverence? It doesn't mean I'm afraid you're going to hurt me. So whenever you read the, the, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, you know, or those type of statements, it means reverencing God respecting God, appreciating his character. That's what it's talking about. Not, oh, he's going to hurt me unless I obey him. Right, Thomas? Uh, just, it brings me back to the story in Exodus where God's telling Moses and Aaron, stand back, I'm going to murder a slew of them. That's what he told them. Stand back, they're all going to die. Yeah. And Moses and Aaron are like, no, we don't want to, we need to get a, he got incense, he started put this incense in charge of saving the people. I mean, it's, that, there's got to be a some aspect of fear. You're going to hurt me type of fear. There's got to be something to do with that. That's why else would he be doing it? He was going to lose contact with all of his children. I think it was an emergency measure. You know, in that situation, do you think God was uh, testing Moses, the leadership, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It's really showing how Moses is a symbol of Christ in the Old Testament. Right. He's willing to stand in the gap. He's willing to say, you know, um, let, let's don't go down this road. And I, I think that's what it's showing there. Um, I don't think God wanted to destroy his children. Right? Pastor, over and over and over again, it says in the Bible, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And yet he said to Moses when he came to the Bible. Take off your shoes as it's holy ground. So there is a time to be in awe. In awe and reverence, right? There's a difference between, like I said, there's two different fears that are going on here in, in the word of God. I, I guess. think that he also had to uh, help these children learn respect. Like, okay, if you go past that rope, you know, to go up the hill, you know, they put a rope around the bottom of the hill. And he said, if anyone that goes past it is going to die or right, touches right, it is right, going to die. You right. go that far and you're going to fall down dead. Right. And he had to do that. But then also, the, something that I loved about what Moses and Aaron said back to God is, Lord, we don't want you to get a bad reputation. Right, right, oh, right. What do you think? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Do you, want to do you think God needed that? Moses and Aaron to convince yeah. him? <laughs> I mean, he knew all. He knew what was going to happen, right? Um, so I think there was a different situation going on there. Yeah. So in the Nicolaitans' teachings, the law of God is done away with, right? I mean, that's essentially what they're saying here. That is, you don't have to obey the law of God. Obedience doesn't matter, and I think we can show that obedience does matter. If you notice the the adjectives that describes God in, uh, let's look in Romans chapter 7 and verse 12. Notice the adjectives that describe 
the Ten Commandments is the same adjective that describes God's character because the Ten Commandments are just a transcript of his character. Is it, is it watering down God to God is love? Isn't that a form of just neutralizing God as there's accountability, there, there is structure, there is disobedience. Like if, if God is only love, then I don't have to fear his vengeance. I don't have to fear his judgment from a worldly standpoint. Like if, if if my interpretation of God is only love, then he's not going to hurt me. Yeah, and and if you're connected to Christ, right, then you don't have to fear being hurt by God, right? But there's a consequence when Jesus comes back again and all the glory of God is being revealed and you're not connected to Christ, then the consequence of that is you're going to die. And these people who aren't connected are going to be afraid, right? Thomas and then Tina. Also, I don't think that it's necessarily true that just because God loves you that he will never hurt you. Because parents love their children, but they still get the belt out sometimes. Yeah, chastisement. <laughs> chastisement is, is, that's why when you read punishment in 1 John 4.18, the word there is torment. <laughs> Punishment is something that a parent will do because they love their child, but they're not going to torment their child. That's why I think the better word in First John 4, 18 is torment, not punishment. Tina? That's kind of what I was going to say. There's consequences. You have consequences for your decisions, for your actions. God loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you, but if you choose to do something bad, there's a consequence. Right, exactly. He's, you know, it's not, we're not in the perfect world. We, we blew that. <laughs> yeah. So there's going to be consequences. There's going to be evil. There's going to be bad things happen. But it's like you said, ultimately, it's, they're, they're teaching her to burn. You're, right. you're going to be, like you said, tormented forever. Right. That's, you go to space, you're that's not space the you situation. Don't you think there's a difference between um, someone, well, I know that there is. If someone that, doesn't love my child tries to prep them makes me very upset yeah you know yeah and, uh, they're doing it with the wrong motive right right and so i think that's the same way it is with god exactly he loves us so much and he loved these children of israel and uh and he wanted to change their attitude about him be respectful for woman and they weren't they were not respectful and uh and they loved them it was it was out of love that he was doing that that's exactly right. Amen. That's true. I think that God just uh, a lot of times allows the natural order of things to happen. Like That's true. If you don't put gas in your car, you're going to run out of gas. Mm -hmm. Like that just happened to me recently. I just, <laughs> I thought, all right, I know, I, I thought for sure I had enough gas to make it to the gas station. I did not. And so I ran out of gas. So that's just. How you far did you have to walk? <laughs> uh, I, I have a wonderful that, grandfather who yeah. brings me gasoline when I run out of gas. Oh! <laughs> are, are, you're not, are you spoiled? Maybe a little. <laughs> I, like, I like to say blessed. There you go. There you go. Sounds a little better. Amen. Life lesson. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. The Nicolaitans, what they were doing at that time was saying it was okay to eat the meats that were offered to idols and join in the uh, prostitute situation. Those were the things that they were going against the church at that time. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter what you do in the flesh, as long as you believe. Right. It's just so Gina? <clears throat> there was then right. you know, like God and love and, and fear were more towards reverence of God when you say fear, but it's also fear. Because in Matthew 10 28 it says to fear not them which could kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the body and soul. Yeah, I, I, I think there is something about an ungenerated heart, a person who's not converted. Uh, if you show them this is the consequence of not having a walk with God, they're afraid. Well, then they can go to God because they're afraid and understand his love, right? So there is that. It can be a motivator to take us to Christ. That's true. But I think ultimately God wants us to serve him out of love, not because we're afraid he's going to hurt us, right? 
he wanted to talk to the Israelites, but they said, no, no, you talk to Moses. Yeah, when they, when they saw the trembling mountain and the burning mountain and the... The, not talk to yeah, him. the lightning and the thunder, and they heard God's voice. It was like Moses, you go talk to him. <laughs> Let's see, somebody else had their hand up. Who was it? Okay, Raymond and then Maurice. First John uh, 4 19. I like this verse. It says, We love him because he first loved us. It wasn't yeah. he first hated us, he made it easy on us, and it's still hard. Yeah. I mean, he he did it right, and we're still struggling with the love part. Yeah, yeah. Even though he loved us first, yeah. with he the did. relationship mindset, you know, if you have a a relationship with somebody that's hating on you, it's kind of hard to like. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> God loves you even in the middle of when you're in the middle of sinning. He still loves you. And that's true. He loves yeah. the sinner, he the sinner. Right. That's true, Maurice. We've kind of talked all around it. <clears throat> Doesn't God say, and I don't know where it's found, that those he loves to chase him. That's right. And I know that I got chastened a little bit when I was in my growing stage of learning because sometimes I needed help finding the boundaries. And I think God sometimes helps us when we don't see the boundaries well and chastens us because he really cares about us. He wants us to recognize the boundaries. Right. He knows that having rules creates uh, a peaceful environment. Order. Imagine if we lived in an anarchy yeah. in America. How unpeaceful it would be. Do we have to imagine yeah. those things? <laughs> okay. Yeah. It could get worse. It could get a lot worse, right? And I think it will be. And the yeah. Bible predicts this or prophesies it's going to happen like that. Um, notice in Romans chapter 7, we're talking about the law of God here. He says in verse 7 that he had not known coveting unless the law of God had said, thou shalt not covet, right? And that's in Romans 7, 7. Notice what he says about the Ten Commandments there in verse 12. What adjective does he use in Romans chapter 7, verse 12? Whoever not holy is the same adjective that describes God's character, right? So when we say, oh, the Ten Commandments are done away with, we don't have to obey the Ten Commandments, what are we saying? Of God's character done away with? We don't have to listen to God anymore? I mean, really, that's what they're, they're saying. If they take that logical idea to its final outcome, right? Notice what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 19. Depends on what translation comes up that we're going to see what kind of Corinthians what? 719. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Mm -hmm. Keeping the commandments of God is what matters. What is that? That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19. Can I do one from the Old Testament? Is that okay? What are the last two verses of Ecclesiastes. Somebody could read Ecclesiastes chapter 12. What are the last two verses there? Yes. What does it say? What are the last two verses? Let's do both verses. The end of that matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Right. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And what is the standard of judgment is the Ten Commandments. So notice, what does he say there? The whole duty of man is to respect God, reverence him, and keep his commandments. And so this idea that the Ten Commandments have been done away with. Do you know any verses in the Bible people try to use to say the Ten Commandments have been done away with? How many verses? What verse in the Bible, what passage do people say, oh, we don't have to keep the law of God. You know, what's interesting about this, we'll say, well, it's important for us to keep the fourth commandment, right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, six days shall thy labor, do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. He tells us to keep it holy. No, we don't have to keep that day holy. It's been done away with, right? Isn't that what, isn't that what you hear? They say the Ten Commandments are done away with. Then you talk about, yeah, well, can you give it an adultery? Can you kill? Can you? Have... No, no, we need to keep those. Really, it's the fourth commandment they're saying it's done away with. Right. You know, I'm talking about people from other, other well, not. 
the first four. I've heard the yeah. argument the first four are not American. Oh yeah. Six so it's okay days. to worship other gods, yeah, right? It's okay to, it's okay to just Mary. take God's name in vain, it's okay right? To put a statue of Mary yeah. in our church. Yeah. All right. It's a lack of understanding. <clears throat> it is a lack of understanding. And but I think it's kind of like idolatry. If you're, it's self worship because you're putting your rules in the place right. of God's rules. That's exactly right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is convenient to this. Yeah, their narrative right. needs to fit. Right, exactly. Yeah, Eventually, they will be getting rid of the last six. I can find. I'm going to say, oh no, we don't need. We don't well, need already in the process, work. right? Already, most people in the world, um, I would say, don't even know what the Ten Commandments are anymore, right? We live in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the world we live in today. Murder is okay as long as you're younger than a certain age. Then you can murder people. But if you're if you're if you're older than you know however old, then then you can't murder. People. It you know it really doesn't make sense. That, you yeah. can if they're young enough. Yeah, if they're a baby in the womb, you can. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just a sad situation. So whenever you hear the laws done away with, I think we can bring up. What I like to do is I like to go to John seventeen three, the biblical definition of eternal life, knowing Jesus, right? Okay. Then I go to First John chapter two verses three and four. What is the evidence that you know Jesus? First John chapter two, three, and four. And by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandment is a liar. The truth is not in him. Did you hear that? Whoever says, I know Jesus, but doesn't keep his commandments is a what? A liar. A liar. And we do lie to ourselves, don't we? We can lie to ourselves, can't we? We got to be careful about that. If we're willing to become a Christian and surrender our lives to Christ, then we need to follow what it says in John 14, 15. I was told that I was a liar because I was confronted by who used to be pastor of one of our denominations, and now follows another denomination. And he said, uh, well, do you keep me? He said, well, I tried to. But you don't really, do you? Or do you really keep this? Because no one can keep the law. So we're just lying. So yeah. Says, but then it, it turns around and says, if you don't keep the law, then you're a liar. So that's like he's saying, if you do say you keep the law, you're a liar. It just seems like crazy so reasoning to me, but it's hard to get through people who are convinced of this lie. Right. Notice what it says. Isn't that a pretty powerful text? First John 2, 3, and 4, right? <clears throat> Let's go to one more passage in First John. It's chapter 5. And let's read verses 1 to 3. And then we'll, we'll finish up our Sabbath school. First John 5? 1 to 3. If somebody could read that. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, he believeth that he is the Son of God. And everyone that loveth him, that begat loveth him also, that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Notice, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. <coughs> right? We want to experience the love of God. The love of God results in us keeping his commandments. A person who says, like the Nicolaitans, right? Oh, it doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want to do. Each one saved, always saved. It doesn't matter what you do in the flesh as long as you believe in Jesus, right? Really, what, what they're saying is as long as you acknowledge that Jesus existed, you're going to be saved. And must that's a lie. It must be pretty important. He says it multiple times. He does, doesn't he? So. What is he doing there? He is, just like Irenaeus said, John is preaching against the teachings of the Nicolaitans, right? He's preaching against the teachings of the Gnostics. He's preaching against the teachings that were taking people away from Christ and putting their minds on something on the ways of the world. It's okay to go and partake of the prostitutes at the temple. It doesn't matter, right? As long as you believe in Jesus, you can go do that. And that's what was taking place, wasn't it? They were doing these filthy deeds in the flesh, and it was destroying their lives spiritually as well as physically. And he was preaching against that. Do you see 
how you see this over and over in his writings, especially in the first John, we see him preaching against these types of false teachings. It's like the same thing as Luther, you know, presenting doubt, doubt, right, doubt. right. Pastor, Pastor, that uh, verse 7 in First John 5, where there are three that bear witness in him, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. Is that, has that been changed? I mean, can't you use that to show the Trinitarians that there's a, there's a spot that it says the three? Mine says, for there are three yeah. that testify the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Mine says. Read verse 10. He who believes in the Son of God as a witness in himself, he who does not believe God has made him alive because he has not believed the testimony that God has given to his son. And see, that's the problem is the word of God is clear when it comes to those type of teachings that you're talking about. And, uh, the, the, but they don't believe it. They don't, they don't believe it. They don't take it for what it says. They make excuses. They say, oh, well, that's been added. That's been added later. 11 and 12 describe what that testimony is. Yes. In 1 John chapter 5, great chapter. Let me encourage you to read it, uh, chew on it, talk about it, discuss it. It's a great chapter to go through. Father in heaven, we thank you. These great truths in the word of God, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the only way, that our righteousness is found in him. And Father, we pray that if any one of us need to repent, give us that repentance. We choose to have it. We want to repent. We want to turn away from our sins. We ask that you give us a love for righteousness and a hatred for sin. Please change our hearts and help us obey you from the heart because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming today. Thank you, Pastor. That's exactly right. <laughs>
you can try to tell them. I mean, they make fun of you. Right. You don't understand. <laughs> but they get hard to do that. You gotta walk away. They're not looking at the truth. There's nothing you can do. All you can do is share with what God says and pray about it. And you can't convert that. I used to work for the church. I was a church for 30 years. The chapel room. Six 